And if you want to read their full bios, these people are, you know, um, giants in their field. Uh, you can go to the app and, and read on. I have a whole page, which I won't subject you to at this time. Um, and I will, however, turn it over to Dr. Vernon. Uh, please, let's welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to give you a bit of an overview of some of the wi uh, wide area wireless networking projects that we've been involved with, and I'll start off with the HP RIN project. And we have, just to get moving right away, we have a, a network, as I pointed out, and I don't know if there's a pointer here, so I'm using my digital pointer here. The uh, We span from the San Diego, uh, UCSD in one corner, all the way out to the far side of the Salton Sea, up to Riverside County to a place called Toro Peak, and then all the way out to San Clemente Island on the offshore region, 72 miles offshore. So that's basically the area that we are covering. Uh, HP Wren started in 2001. We basically are trying to put internet capability into the remote environment so we could attach sensors and things like that. One of the sets of sensors that we ended up putting out there uh, was seismology. That's how I first got involved with it. But we also put cameras up on top of the mountain peaks to observe weather conditions and things like that. This all started in 2001. Uh, let's move forward to where we're, one of our most recent fires, one of the Whittier fire in, in uh, July this year. And you can see where let's see, this one actually, oops, let's go back. So you can see it kick off there and spread across the mountaintop. So this gives you a real-time situational awareness. This was this past July. This is the first of the big fires that, that really hit the state of California this year. This turned out to be a small one compared to the Thomas fire and compared to the ones in Napa, which, uh, we'll, which Graham will probably talk a bit more about later. But you can see about how much information that you get. You can assess this in real time. You can come back later and reassess as things going on and, and make to look at how decisions were made, what choices were made, and how to use types of equipment and things that were done later. We did burn over the summit of this particular mountain. Uh, you can see the cameras will stay functioning and we get painted with fire retardant on the right hand or east camera there. Yeah. <laughs> I just wish they'd wash it off. Now this is a different, this is the pan tilt zoom camera which you also put in there. You can see how we can get much higher resolution, much more detail in views into the area, but you, you don't, you kind of, I've come to the conclusion that you actually want to have both on these major facilities, you want to have the full 360 degree fixed cameras like I showed you before, as well as the PTZ cameras that you're showing here. And I'll let Graham talk a bit more about the PTZs and the value of those. So this is kind of an early start of the summer, and this is, these are cameras that we just put up last De uh, the December before. So they were only in place for about you know, six months before this activity happened right underneath. But one of the things that we wanted to talk about and that uh, Graham and I have particularly been looking at over the years is this uh, concept of this multi-hazard, because really the fundamental issue here is the wide area networking that we put into place. We were uh, able to put in you know, the network that we allow us to put in, we have the wildfire cameras, we have seismic sensors that can be used for earthquake detection, we have meteorological sensors that can be used for various types of uh, observations, and uh, uh, such as um, atmospheric rivers, things like that. So the idea is that you have a network in place that allows you to put in uh, that are all IP accessible. They allow you to have real-time access to data. You want to put research quality sensors in place so that you can get, you know, that these these sensors are not only used for uh, have the dual use capability that they can be used for public safety as well as for uh, scientific research and, and for long-term longitudinal studies. And you also want to design these networks to have the high reliability and resilient capability so there's no single points of failure. Here's an example of the, some of the meteorological sensors that we deploy on some of our sites. Uh, this happens to be on top of Mount Laguna. We have uh, and you can see pictures of the cameras as well as some of the meteorological sensors in place. 
A place where this might be actually important is uh, this is a image of a uh, flood that occurred last year in the uh, Santa Margarita River Basin. So some of you know where the Santa Margarita Ecological Reserve are. You can watch the river flow. You'll see a waterfall on the, on the uh, left-hand side of the image there, which will start to kick up as the rainstorm gets, works through. You can see it there on the, on the, right hand, on the left-hand side of the river there. But this is the kind of information that is important after you know that downstream all this stuff is going to be hitting there in you know half hour to an hour below behind when you're actually imaging this this uh, activity up in the in the river itself. Another way that the HP Ren network has been used is to actually deploy to connect remote fire stations in the backcountry. So San Diego County is a big distributed county. A lot of the region we didn't have. We didn't or still don't have fiber optic uh, capability throughout the county, but we have 60 fire stations in the back country. So having that available to connect up to all those specific stations has allowed people to make more effective use of the, of the resources there and to also actually it turns out that you know, people use that information for training and, uh, and helping coordinate fire crews in a, in a way that they were not able to do before. From the uh, so so basically we there's another part of the project which was the alert SDG&E which is an overlay of Pantel zoom cameras which we just uh, lay, put in 15 cameras in San Diego County this past year. This is modeled on what uh, Graham Kent system, so I'll let him talk about the capabilities of that. Um, but we can provide uh, early fire detection, and situational awareness. Things are when messages come in, you get 911 calls. People in the, the fire agencies look at these things right away and, and assess what type of resources they want to allocate. Uh, we can provide enhanced firefighter safety and public safety. We can support earthquake early warning and extreme weather monitoring so we can look at the all hazards point of view. Uh, future, in, future enhancements, we're looking at the, uh, upgrading the backbone into, we have a, HP REN got deployed, started deployment in 2001. Well, 15 years of technology allows you to need to refresh some things, so we're in the process of finishing off the uh, refresh of current technologies. We're trying to fill in coverage uh, gaps in San Diego County. We're trying to extend the alert system in Southern California and into the Central Coast region. So the first things we're having active discussions with, which I think I, we've mentioned before, is up in Orange County, working into Riverside County, and then also out of Santa Barbara. Uh, the one other thing that's kind of interesting is that we have already assembled a 15-year time series of data for the camera data, for the meteorological data, and those can be used for looking, assessing various aspects of, of climate, uh, change and things like that. And then there's a set of web pages here that can be shown, and so I will leave it at that and turn it over to Graham. All right, thanks. Thanks, Frank. This is going to be quick. I just have a handful of slides, 20 or 30. No. Um, now, just quickly, because I know there's probably a lot of questions out there, but um, so between the two areas that really started out near Tahoe and obviously earlier on in San Diego County, it's kind of mushroomed into a larger um, kind of notion or idea. And we use this term alert wildfire to kind of talk about all these integrated networks that are now uh, dying their way across the West. And this is, again, a joint uh, project between University of Nevada, Reno, UCSD, and now University of Oregon. So we have the ducks on board. So we get to change our uniform every, every day or something like that. Um, so again, our network uh, literally goes from the Utah border to basically Sacramento, from a little bit north of Reno, all the way down to Las Vegas. So it's kind of a big network in that sense. A lot of opportunity to see a lot of fires. Um, but one of the things uh, Frank alluded to is we kind of did the next iteration of the fire camera using these brand new near-infrared uh, pan tilt zoom HD cameras. And the idea was how do we go out and kind of hunt for fires? How do we make sure that the fire management officer can turn on a dime? He or she can know exactly what to put on that fire. Because if you over-respond, you blow money. And if you under-respond, then it's a mess. And, um, 
And one of the tricks we did was putting on-demand time lapse. So if you go to the Alert Wildfire web pages and you want to just see what the last 15 minutes look like, you can see it. Last six hours, you can see it. That's very useful, and the world can see it. Um, obviously, not in this area as much as in Nevada, but uh, having integrated lightning uh, services is very useful. This third item here is one of the most critical things. I, I can't tell you how important this is. <laughs> You need to basically service this to the public, and it can't crash. If you look at the 7.9 earthquake off of um, Alaska a few months ago, Noah put out text. Don't go to our website unless you live somewhere where there might be a tsunami. Are you kidding me? Right? The failures in Sonoma County, the failures even the, what the 211 system in the Lilac fire went down. So we're building a lot of systems that suck when you need them. That's the bottom line. <laughs> So luckily, we had our first chance with the lilac fire to hit it hard, and it survived because we had it up on that uh, Amazon Web Service Infinite Scale. We love Wi-Fi and FireMap because we feel that's another important thing. So if we can help discover or understand the fire earlier, then if we can then burn it on a computer, we know how to get people to move out of the way. It's that simple. And if you think that's a really like simple idea, they needed this like no one's business in Sonoma with the Tubbs fire. They didn't know about the fire. They didn't know the scale of the fire. didn't know how fast it was burning. Everything was just essentially no information. And a lot of people died. Um, and again, we're learning to deal with power systems. That's kind of boring, right, power systems? But when your big fires happen in December, you might have to deal with power management. <laughs> so. SDG came into being. They went and bought all the firefighters' iPads, not so that they could watch TV, but they could watch the fire when they're going to it. Think of that concept. So that's really cool. We want a distributed system. You shouldn't have to be in just one location to use the cameras. And we've been working with uh, various smoke detection algorithms, which is great, but understand this 911 will beat virtually all smoke detection algorithms at this point because there are too many annoying people with a cell phone calling in fire. And the biggest value of these camera systems are that first 20 seconds. How do I scale? Is it blowing up on me? Or do I de-escalate and spend 10 grand instead of 100 grand? If you go to the, this is an example of the Alert sdg &E or Alert Tahoe or the BLM sites, Alert SoCal, you see a bunch of cameras on the bottom, you click one, and then you get a view of, oh my god, the lilac fire, that doesn't look good. And on the right hand side, there's a map and it shows you where you're looking and you can actually cross two cameras and locate fires and all this fun stuff. But this is really, in the end, a way of doing the 21st century lookout tower. We want to crowdsource cameras because having looked at these cameras for five years, I can guarantee you that the human eye will beat every computer algorithm ever and since all of our kids do useless things on computers, you might as well have them look at this map during those red flag and crimson days. So we really like that idea about getting people involved. And across all the different alert wildfire networks, we were involved in almost 250 fires this last year. So that was, you know, it's not just a couple fires. There were a lot of, um, with the recent fires in uh, the Napa, Sonoma, and um, Ventura area, people are talking about, you know, wire slap, broken wire lines. And this is just an example of a similar thing under a very windy day in Lake Tahoe. And then what we're going to do is push it again. There we go. So these near-infrared cameras, you'll see the light first bouncing off the clouds. And we're really only 10 minutes right now after the wire broke. That's from 19 miles. To be able to detect these things early on is easy at night. It's easy in the day, but it's really easy at night. And a lot of these sundown or Santa Ana fires start at night, and that's why that's important. The other thing this one illustrates is Fire cameras are cool, and there are a lot of assholes in this world. If you look at the very bottom of that, the arsonist who basically, this was his 30th fire, he started it during this wire slap event, and the, it's blowing 60 miles an hour, 
and they knocked it down. So not every fire with all this fancy technology are you going to be able to knock down, but this one they did, and they did a good job of, of maintaining and, and reducing the size of the lilac fire. So again, there's a lot of upside to having these camera systems um, in, in these worst of worst days. So this is kind of a setup for the next speaker, but um, here's an example of Wi-Fi fire map for this emerald fire, the first one I showed you, and uh, the orange is the prediction and the charcoal gray is, of course, the charcoal gray, what burned. And you can see it does a pretty good job. And that's another thing to think about. If we can discover or better understand these fires right away, we can burn them on a computer and we can take those results that are only seconds away and start moving people, start strategizing how to knock down fires. And I really do believe in you know, maybe we all live in our own bubble, but my bubble of late is that given this last um, about four or five months and having been in Napa, Sonoma area six times, is that for California and the West, this is our moonshot, people. I mean, we can talk about climate change and the importance of that. We are burning down. We need to get infrastructure out there yesterday and save lives. And by the way, you pretty much make the money back in about two years by descaled responses. So without further ado, I'm going to let somebody burn some more fires on a computer. So thank you. Thanks for the really eloquent setup. And I pride myself in being part of UCSD and working with some of the biggest uh, networking people there, and also network science people, including Frank Vernon, Larry Smart, Tom DeFanti, and many others. And from 2000 to 2010, we actually used these networks for different environmental applications, oceanography applications, um, many different things, even like counting wolves and things like that. And we also observed 2003-2007 fires, and what we've really seen in those is uh, as uh, but Frank and Gray mentioned the cameras and the infrastructure overall, the network was being useful to situational awareness situations, uh, especially in wildfires. And it sort of in intrigued us. We are using this data for different purposes. Can we use it also for wildfire behavior? We are not at that point just monitoring the fire, which is very important, but can we go beyond that? And as you know, these fires are happening, call it climate change, call it fire suppression efforts over the years. When they happen, they are stronger and bigger, and now they are more frequent. And we don't know where the fire is. When a fire happens, literally the question is, where is the fire? Everyone's asking each other, and being able to see helps. And where is the fire going is the next question when we can now detect where the fire is. So our goal was, again, a simple idea. Can we come up with the direction and rate of spread of the fire using an integrated system? There were fire modeling tools. There were access to satellite networks, data management situations. Um, and through HPRN, very specially uh, in the San Diego County, we had access to network connection to emergency command centers. So the idea was before, during, and after the fire, can we use this information to do some special thing? Historical information that we can collect related to these fires and come up with that rate of spread information as fast as we can. So big data being HPRN cameras, uh, weather stations, satellite information, the information that we are crowdsourcing from the public, and the previous models and fuel, topology, uh, topography, and all kinds of um, landscape information, and many different things that related to fire modeling. And then we put that through an integrated system that builds on these networks, but also brings computational and storage facilities together with them with automated processing capabilities, and create views over it, that bits of information that we can communicate. So we are now adding, uh, so to say, visualization and fire modeling capabilities to it. 
There were two main building blocks, which is the HVRAN network and an existing fire modeling tool that was developed over the years. And they were both very, very useful in fire context, but they were not uh, being used to do fire modeling together in real time. So that's kind of what the, one of the things why fire system does is bring together all this information, put them through uh, analytical modeling uh, tools, and then communicate to this interface that you've just seen called FireMap, uh, which is a um, parameterized fire modeling interface that brings together real-time data in different layers of a map for monitoring of that data and also for creating what-if scenarios and real-time fire models uh, to manage different fires. Um, so this was really... Uh, this grabbed attention from the fire community in different ways. And our first collaboration was with uh, LA Fire Department. And now we work with San Diego Fire Departments and over 20 fire agencies um, in a friendly partnership basis. Um, the tool was used initially, um, especially through with interactions with LA Fire Departments in Blue Cut Fire. And we can also add things like when there's a camera, can we bring more? bring in uh, some more capability is to curate the data. So any type of data in FireMap, uh, behind it there are different curation scenarios that brings this data in the best possible way in the way in the formats uh, and resolution that the modeling tools can take advantage of. Uh, fast forward to 2017, fall 2017 was to say the least devastating in the, uh, in the California region. Yeah, we lost something, but it's going to come back, I'm hoping. Um, I hope. Um, so over fall 2007, we were able to communicate uh, fire models and real-time fire information to public. Um, the site was accessed by more than 800,000 people. I can reset that if you'd like. This is detected. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, the site was accessed by public as well as situational awareness uh, or um, um, incident command groups. And we had about 800,000 people, public, access the site to reach out to information. Uh, and we had about 8 million, about 8 million hits on the website. So it goes to that scalability access Graham was talking about as well. Um, we were also operationalized as a part of uh, a larger team with the San Diego Fire Department, which will in turn need even more connectivity and more uh, networks to communicate the information. So I'll probably cut this movie short, but just to show you what happens, um, when you go to fire map, there are different layers on the map um, that are served through the uh, mapping interface here. You see, for example, fuel information, um, and you could distinguish between different fuels. Uh, so by clicking on each of those pixels, you can actually understand what's there. On top of that, uh, we can go back to uh, historical fires, so we can learn from what happened. And for example, this shows fires starting from uh, way back to 1800s. But if you go to the last 10 years, um, as you'll see here, you, if you click on each of those uh, fire boundaries, um, you can actually see which fire it is and when it burned and things like that. So these are historical information. These are static information. Now think of combining this information with real-time information, which is when you start really driving a lot of um, value out of big data. That's kind of the promise of big data. You can zoom into an environment. You know all this is already built in. And then we can now access, let's say, weather in the region. If there's a Santa Ana situation or a special weather event, we can see those uh, winds and humidity and uh, temperature and the direction of those winds, uh, what they are doing. So 
what we are getting from the network now uh, is just actually made available through a mapping interface for more people to understand. Um, so, and then we can graph things over a certain period of time, and uh, we can also um, add things like now, um, if this is the situation and a fire happened, as you see there, what's the forecast for the next couple of hours? And can we now bring that forecast that comes from NOAA, not from the real-time network in the situation, and model a fire and see what would happen uh, over that time? Now compare that to what would happen if there was a special weather situation like a Santa Ana event, which means there is um, high temperatures, um, fast winds, uh, big gusts, and also low humidity. As you see, the difference between those two fire models actually helps us to set up um, response scenarios uh, on advance, or if there are things related to you know, modeling different fuels and things like that, that could also be done. And during the fire, why we need these networks, we actually need to do something special. We actually now can model the fire and then slowly start bringing real-time fire parameters through these networks and adjust those models in what we call dynamic data-driven ways. So we can go back to, uh, we can understand the dynamics of how the fire is burning and then adjust them. So think of uh, a weather map moving over time. Now we can generate fire models moving over time as well. Or we can go back to uh, an earlier situation. If we get um, boundaries of a fire over time as a time series, we can go back historically and say, this is the data that was the weather data on that day, and if you started from that boundary, this is how it would have gone. So we can create these both learning and real-time response scenarios uh, through tools like this, and by, by setting up half an hour uh, intervals on these estimated time of arrival of the fire, uh, you can communicate this information to different authorities so they can um, do responsibility sharing. You know, the first half an hour is someone's responsibility and the first two hours beyond that is another person and things like that. And we can even uh, come up with census information related to it if there's an evacuation scenario. So. Uh, the point here is by combining um, different types of information, uh, information coming from these broadband networks that we need in real time, uh, and historical information, we can create solutions that are unprecedented. And these networks are really enabling this in any field of science, and fire monitoring uh, is one of them. We won't do these alone, of course. Um, this is a big team effort, in addition to what we see here, which is the core Wi-Fi team with our researchers and students. Uh, we work with also partnerships, our authorities, and different fire departments to build these systems hand in hand. So whatever we do, it needs to be very collaborative and um, as um, scientists, as data analysts, as network engineers, and municipalities. We need to all, or rural um, command uh, officers, we all need to work together to create these solutions. And, but the starting point is really having access to that information and these networks. Thank you. So uh, let's see, Matt Rantanen, for the record. <clears throat> I am uh, running the Tribal Digital Village Network in the footprint of these two. They've shown you maps of San Diego County repeatedly with fires burning in them. And I'm going to show you maps where the tribal communities live. And if you have a good memory of what that looked like, a lot of those fires were right where those tribal communities are. So um, in 2001, we started the Tribal Digital Village Network. It was actually a little bit of a marriage of some of the technology and some of the efforts being done at UCSD and the Supercomputer Center and Hans Werner Braun's project. 
HP Ren, which Frank now runs. <clears throat> so the technology was bring seismic activity through wireless back to UCSD from the desert. To do that, they had to hop across a couple Indian reservations, and in exchange, they traded internet connectivity for some resource programs after school. Ethnic studies professor Ross Frank at UCSD looked at this and said, Hewlett Packard's giving away a bunch of money that addresses this specifically. Hans Werner has the technology. He can show them how to do it. And we need to build resource programs for all the tribes in Southern California. So with tribal chairman's approval, they, we wrote the grant as a group. This was right before I got there. Uh, they, they were awarded the grant. About six months later, I showed up in October. I think we started in March. <clears throat> and uh, so at the time that, that Hans Werner and team were out deploying networks, we were developing the process to basically follow in, in his footsteps and figure out how to connect the tribes to the resource programs and then eventually the tribal homes. So um, a little cool little story. It was right at the end of 2001, 2002, beginning. Um, my, at the time, network administrator Michael Peralta, who's no longer with us, spent about 45 minutes in Hans Werner's kitchen sitting at the, at the uh, dining table with, you know, at the time, Lucent and Avaya gear with the PCMCA slot type radios with little pigtails and grid antennas. And they set up a network in his kitchen showing, showing Michael how to network two radios together. And then he basically picked them all up and handed them to Michael and said, uh, now go do that on mountaintops. And if you have any questions, give me a call. So that was the beginnings of the Tribal Digital Village Network. So, um, uh, and this is, this is me, but we don't need to know about me. Um, so there's 109 federally recognized tribes in California. There's a handful of state recognized tribes as well. And so there's a huge population of people. I think we're over a, a million people now. And we have, you know, a, a real need for access to broadband and access to the information that comes across broadband, like the emergency services and the awareness of fire, because we live in these rural communities that are on fire typically every year. Um, let's see, did the not? There we go. So they showed a few pictures, but I have a, have a handful of other pictures from our tower, so you can kind of see what we're looking at as far as. Geography, I mean, it's beautiful, but um, you know, it, it looks really inaccessible. And so, when fire happens, we have little teeny communities like this down in the bottom of a canyon that are very unaware, right? So they're connected. Most of the tribal bu buildings on the reservations are connected to TDB's network. We are deploying the tribal homes as we speak, and we're trying to grow that footprint out to support the tribal homes, but. Each of the tribal communities has connection. We do connect a lot of the fire stations or have backup connections to the fire stations or when they want to be on the internet goofing off instead of on the fires network, on our network at night when they're staying at the fire station, um, they use our stuff. So during the fires when they drop the red stuff, they actually go out and clean the solar panels off. It's totally cool because they know they need internet the next day. <laughs> you know, to watch Netflix. Um, and so here's a few shots of, we, we, like the, we like the panoramic shot on the iPhone. It does really well out in the field. So here's a few shots of, um, you know, just some of our towers in the middle of nowhere. And you realize, you know, how remote some of these locations are. And these are 45 minutes from the beach, right? They're 45 minutes from San Diego proper where everybody goes to SeaWorld and does all those other things. And, and you know, you're looking at this kind of a, of a scenario. Um, information services don't exist in these canyons in these locations with these you know really beautiful landscapes but you know we don't have access to this information funny enough two of those locations that cross the TDV network are still in play and some of those four directional cameras that Frank was talking about are on our our tower but deploying back to the HP Ren network through our system and we're we're planning to we're, we're doing a power upgrade we're doing roughly $42,000 in solar batteries at each of our back, backbone towers. And as those are deployed, we're going to incorporate cameras at each of those locations and increase the, the visual footprint for fire for the HP Ren network. They give us the login. It's nice. We get to play. We can see, like, is there snow on the tower? Do we want to go today? Um, so um, just a couple more pictures. I just like to see landscape, you know, people to see landscape, see what we're looking at. Our network is... Um, 
over 650 miles of point to point links. If I counted the point to multi point links, I don't even know where we're at. Um, takes a couple hours to get from the data center to the furthest point of the network. And this is San Diego County, which is similar to the maps that they've shown. The tribes are spread out, as you see, the red dots. And, you know, the Pacific Ocean, Mexico's to the south. Um, Imperial County is to the east. And then um, Riverside to the north and Orange County to the north. But the tribes kind of make this backwards arc um, through the mountains, very close to urban urban centers, you know, 20 miles, 28 miles sometimes, but absolutely disconnected before the tribal digital village and before HP Ren were coming through. There was nothing there. Um, there's still very little there to, to support them. So we have a network that kind of looks like that. It supports most of the tribes. There's a couple tribes on Interstate 8 that are kind of doing their own thing. They have access to fiber because of proximity to the, to the actual route. Um, but we're helping them in their wireless solution and, um, you know, just kind of advising. So um, quite, of a, quite a beast of a network. So looking down into the community from the mountaintop, you can see what, you know, there's a lot of burnable stuff out there. So we're, uh, we're excited to have the relationships that we do have because in the 2003 fires in San Diego County, our network stayed up and people were using it to communicate, even though it was you know very minimal amount of throughput at the time in 2003, they were still using it to email and to communicate through some chat systems that were early, like AOL chat, things like that, that were, um, they were able to communicate and able to, to work with each other and families were able to talk. In the 2007 fires, we lost our first tower so our network was basically wiped out. I don't even know if I have it in this slide set. I don't think I do, but um, so we see you get snow, you get really remote locations, but we lost that first tower. We lost our whole network. Reason being, you know, we have <clears throat> we have plants. This is part of that tower. We have plants that are um, sacred to the tribal groups. Uh, Manzanita oak is one of them, and we were not allowed to remove the manzanita from the from the landscape where the tower is. So we actually had a lot of fuel within the fence for that tower to burn down. Uh, when that whole hillside burned and it burned our tower to the ground, um, they, the tribe allowed us to clear the manzanita that was within our footprint so that it wouldn't grow back because it will grow back after fire. And um, moving forward, we're, we're much better off. Uh, we share the wealth. Um, we also try to educate our federal government and our state government. Uh, we have here um, folks from the Federal Communications Commission, and the person in the, the red and white shirt that's standing on one of the battery boxes is Valerie Fasthorse, who runs Red Spectrum in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. She basically came down, stood on that box, and went, you can do this with Wi-Fi? This is awesome. She went home and built Red Spectrum, which is a hybridized fiber wireless network in Coeur d'Alene that makes us look like a tinker toy project. She's phenomenal, and she's up there doing really great stuff. Um, we advise not to get surplus towers out of uh, salvage yards in El, in El Centro when it's 125 degrees. <clears throat> Buy them new. They come with instructions. Uh, I have a bit of an overview of the network, um, things that you can read there. But, but our biggest goal right now is to increase our quality of service Increase, increase the resources that we have access to, connect to Scenic so that we have the accesses that, you know, to the things that, that Scenic has and, and the opportunities there to tie to our higher education, to give opportunities to our community. Um, we're, we're increasing our power because 20 of our 23 towers run on solar. Um, we are looking for smart solutions to support that solar, trying not to burn fuel all the time if we have to with the generator. Um, looking for small wind, looking for, I don't know, hydrogen fuel cell. Let's get creative. So there's a, there's a handful of opportunities, and some of the people in the room have helped me dial into some of those new opportunities. But a quality of service on the network so that we can guarantee a product that the community can rely upon and then get access to things like the, the emergency services and the emergency opportunities to know where the fires are and what's happening with the... Um, with the different uh, situations that are going on. We get Santa Ana winds and everybody bunkers down and assumes we're going to catch on fire because it spreads so fast during that, and that's when the fire bugs come out, the people you mentioned. And, uh, and so, um, you know, we're always prepared for that, and we want to work with the groups that are doing this to make sure that we have access to um, 
to be able to fight this stuff early and, and often um, so that we don't have dramatic disasters. I think I do have here. One of the things, I'm going to hit this. Unlicensed Spectrum has been one of the things that's allowed us to be the most creative in de deploying this network. We are actually so deployed in Unlicensed Spectrum that we can't deploy any more in several of our locations. I can't put up another set of radios because we are using everything in the unlicensed space. So if you have an avenue to somebody that will listen that can affect change in unlocking spectrum for the use of communities, um, knock on that door, make that phone call, do what you can, advocate on the behalf of community networks and some of the smaller networks that are out there trying to deploy this stuff. Because we have really tough ter terrain, and, and uh, wireless is the way to, to solve some of this last mile stuff in this really chaotic um, you know, landscape. So we're really trying to, um, speaking of, flying helicopters to get the places to put tower parts. So we're really trying to open up Spectrum so that we have an opportunity. I have to take something down if I want to put something up, or I have to license something if I want to put something up. Um, we don't have enough to deploy to some of our homes in one community because we use every single frequency and, and channel, channel width, and all of a sudden we're, we're interfering with ourselves. So... That is an issue that's out there for some, some of us, and I'm sure it affects you guys as well. Um, let's see. I thought I had a picture of the tower burning down, but or the burnt one, but I guess I don't. So we, oh, here's one coming up. So this one happened right next to our data center in Paula. It was a small fire, but it, it burned, you know, like 25 acres or something like that, but it was burning right towards our tower, and that guy's dumping the red stuff right when it's headed towards the tower, and he saved it. This was the 07 fires, but not so lucky, right? That's all the manzanita around our tower. And you can see, I got a close-up, stuff burned down pretty bad. Solar panels, actually frames melted, things like that. And this is the scenario that we were very appreciative of this system so that we can stay away from this scenario. Believe it or not, that radio wave's antenna still worked afterwards. It just wasn't waterproof anymore. All the rubber seals had melted. Um, and then you have tribal members that don't understand what you're doing. So they take the closest tool that's in the back of their pickup truck and they affect change, not for the good. So you have to educate. You have to educate your community. You have to be out there helping people understand how this affects them in a positive way, how not to get affected in a negative way, you know, talking about the resources of emergency services and, and, and the resources that allow you to have access to stuff that would take you a 45-minute drive to go to town to do. And I'm, I'm just going to round it out there. Um, the rest of the slides kind of pertain to something else, so I'll kind of do that so we have time for questions. Okay. Um, I think we do have a few minutes for questions, um, so I'll be the mic runner. If anybody has anything, I'm happy to come to you. Stunned into silence? Oh, Mikhail's got a question. This Normally it's my job to ask the first question, but I'll pass the mic to our friend from Prague. Michal Krasek-Tasnet. I have a question for the for the tribal network. Uh, have you been thinking about the building a cell network on top of your infrastructure? Yeah, we, we've been thinking about it. And then we've been dressing up like pirates because you'd have to be a pirate to pull it off in San Diego. <laughs> Verizon and AT&T own the entire spectrum space over San Diego. And um, we've engaged a couple times in conversation about a secondary market license to be able to serve that community because they typically serve the transient pathways that go through the county, the roadways. And, you know, that, that bleeds out, I, I don't know how far, but it bleeds out maybe a quarter mile on each side of the roadway where the tower is. And some of our communities are connected. But like you saw the terrain, there's ridge lines and stuff and houses behind them, and then we lose those uh, connectivity pieces. We're, we're in... We're in talks as much as we can be to try to motivate um, those those companies to expand and support those reservations. But the return on investment for them on infrastructure build out is really small because there's not a lot of population. Um, we would love to do it and send it back to their network. You know, uh, work with them to secondary market license, deploy, and then have it come back through our broadband and tie back to them. They can still be that customer 
and they would still retain that customer even though there wasn't a cellular network. We could do it with a, a smaller distributed antenna set up. Um, and we just haven't run into any roads that don't have a big roadblock at the other end. So yeah, we've thought about it, but it's it's not easy uh, in the states to do that because everybody owns that spectrum for forever. We got another question over here, so we'll follow up with that after uh, after the break. Thanks. Are you interested in, or are you using any three and a half gigahertz spectrum? And I hear that there's some proposed changes that sound like they would be useful for people that want to extend cell service. Is that for all of us? Sure. For you. For me. Uh, well, we use. I don't know if if you qualify or uh, be more specific about three and a half, but we use three six five. Yeah, we do use that. Um, problem is proximity to mil military installation. They still use it for some satellite uplink stuff, and we've been told that you know we can't we can't aim it at Camp Pendleton, but they did allow us to use it locally. So I have a question as I'm walking back to Eli um, for Frank. Um, so in early days of of these high resolution cameras, the bit rates are pretty high because the compression wasn't great and. We, we don't like compression when we have a critical image we want to look at. What are what are some of the bit rates now? Obviously, they're supported on these um, fixed wireless networks, but w give us an idea of how much bandwidth this, these camera suites might use. So when we started, we actually made a decision to use uh, time samples, so we take snapshots every minute or every 10 seconds sort of thing to minimize the bandwidth because we could not afford the streaming video bandwidth now. Um, right now, we can get pushing kind of a really high-quality video on the order of a, a megabit or so. I don't know what you're, is that about what you're getting to? If we do it as just JPEGs um, and do it one sample every um, second, then it might be five megabit. And then we degrade the nighttime because the compression isn't so hot. But then it's so sensitive at night that it's it's a push. So I would say anywhere between one and five megabits a second. But that's per camera, so you have to think about what exactly you're doing. So some of these situations, right, that we might have you know four fixed cameras and the cardinal directions, and then the PTZ. So we it, you can be careful about how much you you soak up. And we have a major incident when every tower is being used in the system then we're going to have to be very judicious in, in the bandwidth use, usage. What we do within the Alert Tile BLM uh, project is we also have fiber that we download off of. So the idea is that we can always get our data back via microwave, but then when all hell isn't breaking loose and the fiber still works, <laughs> that we download that as our first choice so that we can get the, the best um, imagery, but Again, we want to make sure that we have that kind of private network sense during emergencies. So, um, I mean, this is obviously a really amazing uh, resource and really amazing capability. Um, I think that this past year taught us that Southern California is not the only place where something like this is necessary. Um, so, what... I know that this has grown up over, over many, many years through, through the efforts of, of, of a lot of people. Um, how replicable would this be in Northern California? So um, the Alert Tahoe network is partially in California. So it's been going for about five years. Um, just as an example, we're working with Sonoma County and others and trying to put up a network quickly. Um, just for those of you who um, don't know the numbers, there's still about 90% of those counties that haven't burned yet, and some areas that haven't burned in 140 years. And so um, we're doing a combination of trying to use county microwave along with our own microwave to stitch out something quickly. And I think the key word there is quickly. So whether it's Frank's group, our group, our friends in Oregon, or others, we, the, the tribal communities, we know how to build out the network we'd like to build out, which is crap because at that rate, we, our camera is just, there's not going to be enough of them over the next couple of years. So we have to start trying to think of how to make sure that the uh, perfect isn't the enemy of the good and to start working with more partners yesterday 
so that we can get those cameras out and then over time kind of fill in the gaps, get things going faster with the uh, counties. But again, this is a group, I know at least one speaker today was in the Silicon Valley area and we were just there a few months ago and you know, I'm kind of a computer geek, right? We're just laughing at each other like, here's Google, Apple, all these big companies and their whole area is just like Napa. Could go up tomorrow and some of these people won't make it out alive. The high tech capital of the world and there's not a single freaking camera in the area to help the local fire protection districts in Cal Fire. So let me go figure. Let me just put put a little bit more perspective on that. Um, here in Monterey County in 2016, we had um, the Garapata fire, and it was uh, the most expensive fire in California history at the time to fight. It cost over 220 million dollars to fight this fire. That's not property damage. That's just how much they spent to fight the fire. So in that kind of perspective, with these events happening more and more often, it, it, makes, it doesn't make sense not to build these camera networks. One thing I'd like to follow up on is that in your question there is like one of the things that were, that's a difficulty, the software infrastructure and the cyber infrastructures are solid and that they can, and they are scalable. The question that really gets in the scalability is the access to the mountaintops, is actually getting the permits to get things on the towers, it's getting permissions to get in there. And some of these opportunities like Graham's talking about might be through some uh, commercial entity. So how do we s set up the cyber infrastructure and the security, cybersecurity protocols that we can put sensors inside of a private network and yet get the data back to where the processing centers are at U University of Nevada, Reno, or in San Diego, or wherever else they might be. So these are the types of problems that we need to think of, think through. And getting access to fiber at the earliest possible point, one of the things I didn't mention earlier was that Santa Barbara fire, the Whittier fire, that was enabled because I was able to go deploy sensors up on Santa Inez Peak which went a wireless link back to Santa Barbara. But that data came back over scenic to UCSD where we did all the processing and, and, and enabled all the people to access that data. This is the kind of platform we have. Right now we have connections with scenic in Santa Barbara, San Diego, San Diego State, and we're working on getting Orange County and then working for Riverside County after that. So I have, a, I have a follow-on question for Ilke. Um, given the tenuous and sometimes fragile na nature of these networks to do that backhaul to San Diego Supercomputing Center. Um, are there any efforts to provide computing at the edge that sort of push the capabilities farther out into the network? So there are some experimental projects, I would say, to compute on the edge, but there's also an opportunity through the Pacific Research platform and the Chase CI capabilities being built on it with um, being connected uh, through these networks to larger scale 10, 100 gigabit networks that can actually um, analyze the data before it hits the even servers. You know, uh, through the network you can actually connect to a cloud of containerized computing resources that you can analyze things. And uh, these type of capabilities are up and coming. Actually, some of it is there. Uh, to be able to dynamically coordinate those resources and make it available to any application. So that type of capabilities, I think we'll see more and more you know, in the planetary computing scale, mm -hmm. in a way. And more importantly, being able to connect larger scale networks to regional networks to um, maybe r remote, like um, drone, like UAV, like capabilities to bridge the gaps is needed. So when we talk about analytics, of course we're talking about scientific analytics for, for data, but we should also consider uh, analyzing the network itself and on a situation like emergencies or uh, connectivity losses or power losses. There are probably ways to understand the health or the state of the network and fly some UAVs to actually dock into something that can bridge the disconnect in the network so we don't lose 
uh, connectivity to computing storage sensors through these networks. Yeah, I was just going to follow up on that. Uh, we're trying out Steve Smith's out in the audience, our, our leader at uh, UNR, but we're trying to get into the switch facility too in the sense that they have a great, obviously, pathway to the cloud, but if you haven't been out at Switch, it's kind of an interesting experience, but that's the idea that, you know, you're not gonna lose power, you're not gonna lose connectivity, it's a 100% guarantee type situation, and uh, and again, we can't, you know, have something go down on the UNR campus or UCSD campus during one of these firestorms and go, shucks, shoot, I'm sorry, so again, we're just trying to find ways of putting out as hardened environment as we can. Okay, so we're right on time now. So I'm going to uh, close this session by asking us all to thank our panelists again.